I have my father's 54 Chevy pickup, 3100. It's a vehicle he purchased in April of 1955 for the whopping price of $1,100. Now, the reason why he got it so cheap and it had a reduced price is because 1955 was the first year they offered a V8 in the uh, half-ton pickups. So my father saw this in the parking lot. It had been sitting there for about nine months and he saw the reduced price. He negotiated a little bit more and got it down to $1,100. Not a bad investment, huh? considering this thing's probably worth 60 grand now. So this is a 235 cubic inch six cylinder engine, inline six. It's very smooth, makes a lot of torque, makes a whopping 105 horsepower at 3,600 RPMs. Um, believe it or not, that was actually a powerful motor in the 50s. <laughs> and uh, the other thing you have to keep in mind, the gearing's really low on this thing. It has, I think the factory gears are around 410, something like that. And we rebuilt the rear end on this about 10 years ago, and we definitely put the 410 gears in. So you really can't go much over 55 miles an hour in this because it's really designed to tow. It's not really designed to, you know, go on a freeway and cruise somewhere long distance. But we'll talk about that in the future here. So the engine is completely stock, even though it, um, it has a chrome um, valve cover on it. That's just something he put on, and I'm not sure why my father put that on there. But there's a few little things that he changed. I think at one point it had an EGR on it. It doesn't have that anymore. There is a catch can over here, and there is an aluminum radiator on here. So there's a couple upgrades just to make it run better. This is the catch can right here. So any excess oil or things like that, blow by will go in there and it just smooths everything out. It's a pretty nice vehicle there. And other than that, it's really the factory engine. There's no, the, the heads have been rebuilt a couple times. The engine's been rebuilt twice. He's had, I think three valve jobs, but only two rebuilds. And this has about a half a million miles on it at least. So you're probably wondering, what did my father use this truck for? Well, it was basically his work truck when his own father owned a service station in San Francisco. And one of the things they did was they did really simple maintenance, brakes. They, I believe, no, they didn't do alignments, but they did just basic lube oil and filter and brakes and things like that. They also had a parking lot. And the parking lot is what made them so much money. It was on Beale and Howard in, in San Francisco. And oftentimes guys would get a either a dead battery and need help, or oftentimes the car wouldn't start and they need to move the car from the parking lot to my dad's service station. So at one time, this vehicle had a push bumper on it. You know, it's a funny thing to think about how nice this vehicle is, but it literally had a push bumper, a big wooden bumper that went in the front here. And what it did was it allowed him to push a vehicle wherever he wanted to. And the beauty of that was they didn't need a, a tow truck for it. So, like even modern vehicles, if you open the door here, you can see the original badging right here. And of course it has the specs on it. Like I said, it's a 4,800 pound is the maximal, I guess the payload on it. Fascinating, that was, that was the torquey engine, you know, and they offered this 235 cubic inch engine, not only in the half tons, but, but it was in the full ton pickup, the three quarter ton pickups, excuse me, for a very long period of time. This was the engine they used well over a decade. It's amazing. And then when they came up with the, with the V8, then that became, the the engine that was in the three-quarter ton and an option on the half ton okay so interestingly enough the original factory color of this was chevron green and if you're not familiar with what chevron green is it's basically like a darker version of the oregon ducks which i hate that color especially because i'm a stanford fan but it's really a nasty color. I mean, I'll say this, the dark green's a lot better than the like snot green, the snot green you see with the Oregon Ducks. But that was the color that, uh, one of the main colors that GM had at the time, and it was the Chevron green, and it went with the service station color, which was uh, our grandfather's <laughs> service station. Now, I wanna go over how it came to be this color. So, one day, you know, in 1996, uh, my father starts talking to me about, okay, I'm going to restore this. 
And I said, wow, that's great. And he was talking about how Chris Zamet was going to do it at Summit Auto Body. And I looked at him and I said, well, what color are you going to paint it? And of course he says, well, the factory color, of course. I go, but wasn't that green? And he's like, yeah. I go, but you could paint it any color you want. And I didn't say anything more because I thought he was going to say, no, it's got to be factory. Instead, he looks at me and he just had this sparkle in his eyes. And he says, how about red? And I was like, yes. So now I'm going to credit him with everything here. Okay. I helped him with, with this restoration process, but I didn't help him with the creativity part of it. He came up with all of this. So if you notice, it's got a chrome grill. Now, none of these came with a chrome grill. Hate to disappoint you younger folks out there. Nobody ordered chrome grills in the 50s. It, they either came with them or they didn't. And this did not come with a chrome grill. But dad, my dad wanted that thing done and he got it chromed. And the other interesting thing about this is if you notice, he put black tape where it says Chevrolet. And I thought that was a really interesting touch because if you just leave the whole thing chrome, you almost don't even notice the Chevrolet. And other little things he did, incredible attention to detail, unlike me. Notice the blue here, the Chevrolet blue. And then he put black tape in each one of these strips here. You know, and you, you won't even notice that at first glance. You actually have to spend some time looking at this to really notice. Now, the, the truck originally did come with chrome bumpers. That's actually factory. Most cars did have chrome bumpers even throughout a lot of the 70s. And uh, of course, I don't remember when it was, but sometime in 2016, I think it was, you could order the classic plates again. If you notice the black and yellow plate here. Um, one of the things that really annoys me about people in California, they order these classic plates for modern cars, especially on Teslas. And I just wanna shoot every Tesla that has these on there. It's just terrible. This should be on classic cars, all right? That's the point. That was the color of plates everyone had in the 50s and 60s. Okay, let's go around the other side here. Now, um, when I was a kid, this car, this truck was painted white. And uh, there's some debate about whether he painted it white, my father, or he just did the body work and the primer and had it painted. He's 93 now, so it's gonna be hard for him to remember all this stuff. but. These are the factory mirrors. Now, he didn't have these mirrors on when I was growing up. He recently put those on about five, four or five years ago. And uh, there's a company up in Oregon that has these um, reproduction parts. Now, they're not very good. That's why he took them off years ago. He had, you know, regular size um, side view mirrors for trucks, which is very similar to the ones that are on my Suburban. And you notice the chrome handles. He had these re-chromed. It's pretty stunning, just the detail on this. And uh, also, look at the running boards. He painted it a semi-gloss black, which I think looks really nice. Originally, it had more of a flat black to it. A matte, well, not a matte black. It wasn't around then, but a flat black. And even though from the factory, the hubcaps were chrome, he re-chromed them. And you notice, once again, the detail, he has blue, he painted this blue here in the middle. He did that himself. Now, what you have to understand, a paint job like this nowadays is probably about 15, 16,000. Hell, in the Bay Area, it might be 20 grand for all I know. And the reason why he got a good price on this from Chris Zamet was he had it in Chris's shop for about, oh, two years. And dad would go in, my dad would go in there and he would do work to it. He did a lot of the headline, the weather stripping, stuff like that. I'll go over more, more detail in a moment. But he did all this detailing stuff, the stickers, the um, re-chroming of stuff, and including the, um, the hubcaps, the paint he did on that. That was all stuff he did when they weren't working on it. And they would only work on it when they were done in between, you know, short jobs. If you've ever seen a body shop or how they operate, they really make their money on fender benders they will want to get as many cars in and out as possible 
from insurance payments to make money. They don't really make a lot of money on a big project like this because it requires so much manpower on this. I mean, they probably had hundreds and hundreds of hours of just sanding alone on this thing. I mean, you just don't get paint to look like this without a lot, a lot of sanding. So if you're thinking of painting your car yourself, the secret to it is sanding. Sanding before, uh, wet sanding after. The more you sand, the smoother the paint's going to be. It really is. Okay, well, let's go to the bed here. Now, like I said, my father came up with this color concept. It wasn't something I came up with on my own. So, notice the red paint here. And then the letters here, all of them have black tape on it. And again, this really accents the Chevrolet. And if it was all red like that, you would hardly notice it. Now, at first I was a little bit skeptical, but looking at it now, even after he did it, I was just stunned at how nice it looks. And uh, interestingly enough, when you look at the bed here, what most of you, if you're familiar with older trucks, what you're gonna notice is most of the wood on these things are stained and varnished. That's what I thought we were gonna do. My dad says, no, we're gonna paint it black and we're gonna put chrome bolts in. So the, there you go, you got the black wood on here with the chrome bolts, and it just looks so stunningly good with the red. And he came up with this concept all himself. It, he wasn't a young man doing this. Keep in mind, he was well into his 70s at this point. And uh, it's amazing, he, you know, he, he had a certain coolness to him where he knew what looked good. And that's a hard thing to do when you get in your 70s, right? A lot of younger people look look at what you know older people think is cool and you just kind of laugh. I wasn't that way with him. He really, really understood what's going to make this truck look, make it pop, so to speak. And it definitely pops. Okay, if you notice, the dashboard was repainted. All the controls are the same from factory. Um, we're going to go in the glove box here and I'm going to reveal something. The original owner's manual from 1954. This is stunning. This is a hard thing to find nowadays because a lot of these trucks have survived, but few of them have survived with their original paperwork. Now, if I open this up, you'll see inside, everything is pretty much like new in here. Everything that you may need to know. And then interestingly enough, if we go to the middle here, this was his original notes about, you know, the maintenance. And the key actually came inside of this, right here. I'm gonna open this up so you can see. And the key was right in between there. And it had all the recommendations on tire pressures and basic maintenance. Pretty amazing. All, all original. <laughs> it's amazing he hung on to all of this. And I'm glad he did. And it makes sense because I, I have all my original papers from my 96 Corvette and he does with his as well. Yeah, pretty neat. Okay, inside my dad's 54 Chevy with my brother Richard. Hey. He has a lot more memories than I do because he's a little bit older than me. And I'm gonna ask him a few questions because he's got some very funny stories to tell about me as a child in here. <laughs> One of the things I find stunning about a 54 Chevy is just how well these things run. I mean, look, my girlfriend had a 71 Mini Cooper, and I gotta tell you, the brakes on that thing were awful. It hardly stopped. We rebuilt the master cylinder, I don't know, two or three times, and every time we rebuilt it, it got progressively worse. So the brakes work stunningly well in here. The torque is really good. I mean, I almost feel like you could actually get in this thing and tow something, even now. Yeah. It really feels that good. Of course, there's a lot of speed bumps here. We're uh, on a college, community college campus. Okay, then I'm gonna set this up. Now, one thing about 
54 Chevys. They don't have synchros in first gear. So you have to come to a complete stop when you put it in first. All right. Okay, turning around in the parking lot here. As you can see, you're very actively involved when you drive one of these. You've got to come to a complete stop to put it in first gear because there are no synchros. Yeah, Dad used to call it synchro mesh. Synchro mesh, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> so there's a synchro mesh in second and third gear. That's why you're able to shift in motion. Um, but with first gear, they never put them on old vehicles. And uh, yeah, so that's something you have to get used to. And you know, look, this is an old vehicle. <laughs> the gears are, I think that these are the original gears. Like he's, we've replaced a differential on it. Uh, the transmission has been rebuilt once, but truthfully, the gears I think are original. What he told me is that this this particular truck had a very low first gear because he used it to push vehicles and he wanted torque. I always am, I was amazed that this would actually go on a freeway at freeway speed since the gearing was so low. Yeah, it's a... Uh, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. What we used to do to go to plan a water ski trip in this truck. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna pull in here. All right, let's do this. Back in the day, this was the vehicle we used to tow our ski boat. And it used to have a trailer hitch here. And what we would do would hitch up the boat here. And of course you have this little piece of metal here. You'd put the safety chain on. And he doesn't have it anymore, but there used to be a connection for the trailer. So the, the trailer lights would work and everything like that, the electronics. Now, the reason why I want to talk to you about this is what we used to do, and I kid you not, this is before seatbelt laws. This is, I'm dating myself here. We're going back to like the mid to late 80s, right? If you go back here, what we used to do is we'd put all of our gear, our luggage, our suitcases, things like that. We'd leave all our water ski gear in the boat, and then we'd put two lounge chairs here. And typically what I would do is myself or my best friend, we'd sit in lounge chairs here facing this way while my father my mother would be inside and my sister would usually be in the middle between them and I was happy as a clam being out here because it was a lot cooler than being in here no air conditioning it was hot I hated riding up there in, on a you know a long trip like that in hot weather it back here it was great we wear our sun hats and I have snacks here, and we just, four hours wouldn't seem that long to me being here. It was just a really fun experience. Okay, the interesting thing about this is, all of us learn to drive inside this vehicle. Three on the tree. So, I had a little bit more exposure, I think, to vehicles than you and Dana did, because I started driving our ski boat when I was like six years old. It was funny. like. And the reason why is I think I inspired some confidence from dad because I used to get literally get on my big wheel and I would ride full speed down our driveway and I'll show a video of our driveway. It's literally steep as a Mayan pyramid and I would just ride full bore and I'd pull the e-brake on the big wheel and I would do three and four spins and I could always stop one inch before the road. It was the funniest thing ever. And you know, I look back on it, I was probably the first drifter in American history <laughs> as a five-year-old, right? Or a four-year-old. And I could do that every time. I never screwed it up. I never ended up in the street, but I used to freak the shit out of people driving up the street because they'd see this kid ride his big wheel down the hill. He'd yank the e-brake and I'd go spinning and I'd always stop before I hit the road. And I'll never forget one day, this guy pulls into the driveway. We had this big ass Lincoln and he's like, so, and he starts explaining to, to our dad, right? <laughs> you know, he's watering the plants like he would always do at that time. And, and I explained to him, I said, I mean, I'm sorry, the guy explained it to our dad. 
you know, this guy, this son of yours, he almost rode into the street, you know? it's <laughs> You think it's appropriate for him to be doing that. Now, the guy wasn't a dick, so I think Dad was being diplomatic. And Dad ends up looking at him, and he says, well, I'm going to tell you this. He's been doing that for two years now. He rides full bore. He pulls the e-brake. He does these spins, and he stops one inch from the street. And he's done that for two years now, and he's never ended up in the street. <laughs> That's exactly what he told the guy. I kid you not. And the guy is probably thinking, I've got a heart attack because this this kid <laughs> is headed right for me, and I know right. I can't stop my vehicle in time. And then the adrenaline surges, and then phew, yeah, he spins out at the edge of the driveway. Yeah. I, I do that every time. And you know, Dad used to brag about that. He thought that was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> well, think about it. I was probably the first Formula Drifter. That's what's <laughs> they, that's an actual sport now in racing. Drifting. Is it? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. So anyway, um, so he had a lot of faith in me being behind the wheel of things, even at a very young age. So I drove the boat. And look, I'm not going to say it was perfect when I was five and six driving a speedboat, but you know what he would do? He'd sit next to me, and if I wasn't paying attention, I wasn't seeing something, he'd smack me on the head. <laughs> I mean, pretty hard. Boom, like that, right? <laughs> well, we're from the era where parents hit kids, right? Yeah. And he would smack the shit out of me, and it would just reset my brain somehow. No wonder I became the football player in the family. <laughs> yeah, even for me, um, I started driving the boat when I was 13. It developed a confidence because mm -hmm. uh, driving the boat and I had ridden my bicycle everywhere. By the time I yeah. was in high school, I had done trips driving my bicycle down to Big Sur and back. So by the time I was ready to drive, I was pretty ready to go because I yeah. knew how to be a defensive driver being on a bicycle. Sure. And yeah. the boat, boy, I got to hot rod around on yeah. that boat. Yeah, and what you and I would, I remember. Like, in in the afternoon when the water was choppy because of the wind, I remember you and I would take off in the boat and we just go for broke in that thing, jumping would, awakes at like 40 miles would, an hour. I would take those turns and, <laughs> yeah. and, and it would be sliding soft, sideways. Yeah, yeah shallow and draft. At, at yeah. one point, I tore the fin off the bottom of the boat. <laughs> he had to get a new fin. Oh, that pissed Dad off. Well, dude. without the without yeah. the fin, it's harder to yeah, turn. Yeah, yeah, it won't turn at all. Because it's an outboard. It's not like an inboard. Yeah. Or you have yeah, even inboards have three fins in the middle. And that was a yeah. racing boat. I mean, the yeah. bottom was flat. Yeah. It was yeah. about you know trying to minimize friction. Yeah. And it wasn't exactly designed for water skiing, but that's okay. Well, it actually worked for water skiing because it made a very small wake. So it was great for that. The bad part about it was, really, ideally, you want sort of a shallow V in the front and flat in the back. That's how, like, this, the, the um, competition ski boats are, like the Malibu skiers. Mm -hmm. They are literally f flat from the middle back, but in the front, they have a shallow V. And that gives you the opportunity to smoothly cut through the wake. You know, it's a better ride quality where the ride quality in our boat was just shit because it was a flat bottom. It was always smack, smack, smack. But, you know, yeah, the, the, the boat was fun. We yeah, it was fun. more family We really fun. did. And, and it all had to do with this truck because this truck towed it. Yeah. And, th and that's why we're having this discussion right now because um, all of us were very comfortable behind the wheel because we started so much earlier than most people. Well, and you remember that Dad started driving cars when he was 10. Yes, um, so that's what we haven't explained to the audience here. Yeah. <laughs> well, so he grew up in the 40s, right? And any male that was over 18 was uh, involved in the war effort, pretty much. Yeah. And the only cop that was around was an older, senile guy, so they could do whatever the hell they wanted our dad and his friends. And they did. They drag race each other. They used to race each other from Crystal Springs Road to Half Moon Bay because that's how you got to Half Moon Bay in those days. And, you know, they never got in trouble. Now, they did have gas rationing, so they could only do that once in a while. But the point is, he built a car in middle school, seventh grade, and by eighth grade, he was driving to school. You know, even as a kid, his, he would go up to the parking lot um, and move cars. And that take, took a lot of skill because they yeah. were parking them really and tight. And he did it as a child. I, keep in mind, we're not talking about 13 or 14. He did a lot of this when he was like the age I was driving the boat, five, six, seven, eight years old. Well, one of the things <laughs> is that our relatives had a ranch in Tulare County and they yeah. grew cotton. And there, yeah. dad was, they, they, he was driving all kinds of things um, yeah. at, because that's just the way things were. He yeah. just drove. I don't know the range of vehicles, but um, I know that he drove lots of cars. Yeah, he really did. And driving is just something in our family that's, you know, pretty natural. That's why I gravitated toward racing. Well, I want to tell the story about my father. 
Now Dad was somebody who had a natural instinct for teaching. And I think both Scott and I, and to a certain extent Dana, benefited from this sort of genetic tendency to, exp to be able to take situations and break them down into easy steps. So Dad taught me how to drive in this vehicle. And of course the hardest thing about this vehicle is that the clutch has a tremendous spring on it and it takes a lot of effort to hold that clutch in. So in order to learn to drive the clutch, Dad would take myself, Scott in the middle, Dad would sit over on the right, to Bay Meadows Empty Racetrack where I practiced uh, starting and stopping the vehicle. And so it would look something like this. <laughs> I did not know how to let the clutch out smoothly. Yeah. So one day, I'm getting the hang of it, going like this. And then I stopped and hit the brakes too hard, and Scott's boom on the steel dash. Bam, 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 bam. <laughs> Poor Scott. <laughs> oh, it was. Funny. And then we wonder why I have CTE now. <laughs> wow, this is the first time I've driven this vehicle since probably I was in high school, which would have been. I would say college. At some point, you probably drove it. Second gear. Yeah. And you got it now. You got the hang of it. Oh, this is wonderful. What, is, what an experience. It's a And it drives so well. That's the thing. Uh, probably doesn't come across in the video so good. It's just how easy it is to drive. And uh, it runs well. You could daily drive this thing if you wanted to. That's could, a crazy thing. Yeah. So this is this was such a, a memorable experience because Dad had the ability to say, okay, instead of me throwing too much at you, let's begin with the, the, the process of letting the clutch out slowly, moving the vehicle, putting the clutch in, and gently braking. Unfortunately, Scott was in the wrong position. He's, he was standing I would be standing, us. literally. And I'll, I'll give you a better shot of that so you can see that in a but, moment. But it was... It was <laughs> I felt terrible. Um, I was a little runt at the time. Now I don't know why or what the context was, but when I was, uh, you know, teaching, there were many times when I told this story about my kid brother's head going bam, bam, bam <laughs> against the metal dashboard. Students say, "What do you mean a metal dashboard?" Yeah, no one knew because even in the '70s, cars had soft uh, dashes. Even though the hoods would still chop your head off. They, they have the soft dashes. Oh, what a what a wonderful God! I forgot how how much how much effort it takes to turn yeah, the wheel. Yeah, you're very involved, and I love that. I to me, I'm a driver's car person. I love the fact that you really have to be involved when you drive this vehicle. Wow, it's a wow! What a trip! That yeah. was fun. Yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay, so part of the reason why my head got bashed as a kid, if you look at this area touch the dash there that's how tall I was when I was five years old and I just had ADD as a kid I still have it now and I could never just sit still like any normal kid could I wasn't normal so I would stand up and lean against the dashboard and that's why my head would hit that <laughs> and he would do it on purpose sometimes he'd goose the throttle and my head would hit <laughs> because letting the clutch out smoothly and hitting the accelerator is more difficult on this vehicle than others yeah. because the clutch spring is so tight yeah and it's so easy to let the clutch out too soon and then all of a sudden the yeah. whole car is is lunging forward bam bam yeah bam. <laughs> and little scott's head was going bam <laughs> oh my goodness but so I, if you take a look at the pedals here um at the far left there is actually the emergency brake um next to that is the clutch and that's all familiar to you there's the brake now what's probably unfamiliar to you if you've never driven one of these um let's move your foot back for a moment is this is the starter right here now um for some of you, you if you're not familiar with how to the original starters worked on cars um you used to have to go to the front of the car and literally crank it 
to get it started back in the day. And Cadillac was the first company to come up with an electronic starter. And that's why from that point on, you don't see cranks in the front of cars. And unfortunately for a lot of guys, have one or two many drinks at the watering hole, they'd come out and they'd crank it and it would turn on and their reflexes would be slow. And a lot of guys would get broken jaws, broken noses, because the crank would turn, right? And it would hit them in the face. <laughs> yeah. Want me to start it? Um, sure. So what you do is you just, and you don't have to give it a lot of gas. You just give it a little push here and it bangs right over. Okay, go stuff. You don't have it in the starting position. Ignition, there you go. Yeah, there you go. So you just push that button, the starter, and give it a little gas and it bangs right over. <laughs> Old school technology. <laughs> All right, driving this thing is just a joy. You know, because you're, you're very involved and I'm just continuously amazed at how smooth this inline six is makes a lot of torque but it's very smooth it just doesn't feel like uh, it's a hundred horsepower it feels like honestly it feels more like closer to 180 horsepower or even 200 horsepower it's it really is and, it, and it's smooth and that's I think the main reason why GM went with the inline six as opposed to the v6 is it's just it makes a lot smoother power. And that's why you see some of the um, mid-level diesels, the turbo diesels now. You know, a lot of them are straight sixes because it makes smooth torque and power. And I noticed a lot of BMWs are straight sixes. So it's a really popular engine design that you don't see that much nowadays from GM. But you do see it with their mid-level diesel. But it's just so neat driving this thing because it drives so well. It's, it's interesting having the perspective on it because when I first started driving, this felt like a pretty powerful truck to me. Of course, you know, now I'm driving Corvettes with 600 horsepower. <laughs> My perspective has changed and yet I'm still every bit as impressed with the driving of this thing as I was, you know, years ago. <clears throat> Yeah, this thing's just an absolute joy to drive. And it gets a lot of attention. <laughs> so where we are right now is the San Francisco Bay Area. We're on the Mid Peninsula, which is the space between, the, the exact middle point between San Francisco and San Jose. And you'll probably see in the distance the bay. Like I said, these brakes, they work. This thing stops. You don't have to worry about uh, giving yourself extra, extra room to stop. It actually stops. So you got some love right there. <laughs> brakes just work so well on this thing and it doesn't have the excessive body roll that you would expect it to have because of the age of this vehicle it actually it's flatter than you think now don't get me wrong it doesn't stay flat around turns it's a truck but <clears throat> it feels good you don't feel like you're gonna roll this thing over I'm never uncomfortable driving this thing I have all the confidence in the world in it and I enjoy it. I enjoy taking it out. I enjoy, you know, showing it to people because everyone that looks at this truck is just continuously amazed. Wow, what a nice truck. What year is it? You know, and eventually I meet people that want to hear the story of this truck about how we restored it in 97. And my father being the original owner and things like that. And it's, it's, great, uh, it's a great way to meet new people. That is true because it attracts attention. <laughs>
the cooling system works really good. You don't have to worry about it overheating. Uh, the only thing that was uh, an issue with it when we put the new uh, radiator in and the new fan belt, the, uh, no, excuse me, not the fan belt, the serpentine belt, we had to replace the, uh, you know, the blade, the fan. And you can't really get a fan big enough to fit in there nowadays for whatever reason. So my mechanic, Dave Bonar, he put a, uh, an auxiliary fan in addition. So there's basically two fans now in coolant. And, uh, whoa, and I can stop. <laughs> Brakes are working. So yeah, there's plenty of cooling now. And uh, you don't have to worry about that stuff. You can just get in and drive it. You just have to be aware of your oil pressure. You know, you keep track of the coolant temperature, but I do that on a, all my modern vehicles too. I'm always looking at my gauges. And if you don't do that, you should get in the habit of actually doing that. <laughs> no doubt. Okay, so like my brother and I were discussing, this isn't really a vehicle you can drive on your in your uh, on a freeway. Go ahead. It um really can't get much over 55 in this if you do you're gonna be really close to the red to the red line I almost said rev limiter which is really funny they didn't have rev lim limiters in these old vehicles all they have is uh don't rev it that high <laughs> that's the rev limiter from these days I'm gonna do a downshift here very smooth and we are up. Now, some of these hills in this area are just crazy. I grew up in this area and uh, it is really stunning, some of these hills. And I'm wondering if you're seeing the bay like I'm seeing it right now, perhaps not. But uh, a lot of hills through here. Okay, this was the first part of three installments. Big thanks to my brother Richard for filming the whole entire video. That's why it looks so incredible and finding great light and securing an amazing place to shoot. Also, I uh, want to give big props to my father, William, and my mother, Lois. Rest in peace. And please don't forget to like and subscribe to the video. It gets us in the algorithm. See you soon on the next one.